As promised, Pastor Che on is in the studio. Pastor Che, welcome. Hey, Eric. It's great now, to be here. Do I call you Pastor Che or Papa Che? Everywhere I go, people <laughs> refer to you as Papa Che. And I thought, I, I, maybe I got to change to Papa Che. Well, you could call me whatever you want. You could call me Che. You know, it's interesting because around 10 years ago, as I was traveling around the world, people started to spontaneously call me Papa Che. And honestly, I didn't like it because it made me sound old. But then it hit me. I'm a grandfather, you know, so I am a father and a grandfather. I have eight grandchildren, four beautiful adult children. Uh, they all love the Lord, and three of them are pastors, so I'm very Wow. Grateful. Yeah. Uh, okay, so you, in case anybody doesn't know you, you are uh, the senior and founding pastor of Harvest Rock Church in Pasadena. Yes. And I want to talk a little bit about your story. If people don't know you, because I've known you for some time, what, what is your story? I mean, what's the short version of your, your biography so people well, understand how I, you got to be my, where my you are today? My dad was the first Korean Southern Baptist pastor in North America. He immigrated in 1958, but we had some visa problems, came in 1960 with my mother, my sister, and me, and um, just grew up in the United States, right here in Montgomery County, Maryland. So I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area. Even though I was a pastor's kid, I didn't know the Lord until I was 17. And prior to that, I got caught up in the whole drug hippie culture. And I was a heavy drug user. Uh, I decided to sell it because I wanted to take drugs for free. And so I was told by the Montgomery County Sheriff that I was the number one drug dealer in my county. And so I was making... You were the number one drug dealer in your county? Wow. And I was okay. 17 years old, making thousands of dollars per month selling drugs. I think that's probably the entrepreneur's side of my grandfather, who was a banker. He was very wealthy. My dad's side, very poor. But my father, grandfather's side, on my mom's side, they're all business people. So anyway, I'm making a lot of money, and yet I'm absolutely miserable. I had everything I wanted, and uh, I got into Eastern religion. And one day, I was at my friend's house doing my Zen chant. And I said to myself, this is the stupidest thing I've ever done in my life. I've been doing it for one year. So I cried out to God. I said, God, I don't even know if you exist. But if you do exist, reveal yourself. If my parents are telling me the truth, there's a heaven and a hell. Well, I don't want to go to hell. So it was a real selfish prayer, but I really was sincere. I said, reveal yourself. And I wasn't expecting anything there then. But the presence of God came all over me, Eric. And it, then, right, right then. there at the party at my friend's house. And I began to weep. And it wasn't just a little tears. I was sobbing. And I could not stop weeping for the next three days because I felt so much of the love of Jesus Christ. Off and on throughout the day, I would just break down and weep. And I, no one was there to talk to me, to tell me it's Jesus. I just had this encounter. But I began to then pursue him. And within two weeks, I was completely off of drugs. And I just said, I don't understand everything I'm going through because there was still no discipleship. I had my dad's church, but it was a Korean church. They just spoke Korean. I couldn't relate to it. I was actually helping him out. And uh, basically, it wasn't until a year later I found the Jesus People Movement, a Bible study, around 2,000 kids. I found my tribe, and that's when I started to get mentored. But the last day I did drugs was May 25th, 1973. I was instantly delivered. And I believe in all kinds of deliverance. I like the 12-step program, but I like the one-step program better. And that's what happened to me. So you really did experience, because I've heard people talk about this, that they were miraculously delivered from some besetting sin, whether it's cigarettes or, you know, where, because sometimes people make a choice and then it's a struggle, but there are people, and I've heard this from many people, that they were miraculously delivered. You're saying that your drug use, you were miraculously delivered. Absolutely, one day. And was other things. Of course, I was smoking cigarettes. I was a sex addict. I mean, the whole objective of getting high was to pick up girls and turn them on and, and then seduce them. I mean, it, it just being real and carnal. Uh, but it was just an unbelievable lifestyle during that time. But the moment I gave my life to the Lord, I knew I had to be pure. I knew that I had to be celibate. So I made a vow to the Lord, not even to date. I'm 17, so I'm going into until I met my wife. And so I was a celibate for five years. And then um, my wife was also... Uh, celibate. She was a virgin. She wanted to be a nun. She came from a Catholic background, so she was really celibate. But the grace of God, it says the same grace that brings salvation to all men also teaches you to say no to ungodliness and to live a self-controlled, upright life in Titus 2, verse 11. And so that grace came upon me to just say no. 
And uh, I, I just fell in love with Jesus, Eric. I just said, I'm going to serve you. I didn't know anything, but I just I'm going to love you with all my heart because I felt so much of his love. And that's the way it should be because we love because he first loved us. When we encounter his love, then we just reciprocate and we do our best to love him. Of course, we fall short, we fail, but each time we experience his mercy and love and we just continue to run after him. And suddenly it's 40 years later and you have spiritual children and grandchildren. I mean, it's actually amazing. We were together in Washington, D.C. for the Let Us Worship event on the mall right. in D.C. You spoke. I spoke. We had a Rob McCoy spoke. Pastor, J Pastor Senator Josh Hawley. Amazing. Who would dream that this guy is an on-fire Christian? I was so impressed. I mean, he's Absolutely. brilliant. A uh, super brilliant guy and a senator, 41 years old, and completely full of faith. Yeah. Um, it, it was an amazing experience. And then, of course, Jay Koopman, who does these things with, with Sean Foyt. I'm so impressed with Jay, so blown away by his anointing, his talent. His, he's an extraordinary person, but he is really your spiritual son. Yeah, I mean, I've known I didn't Jay I, for 20 years. And uh, we used to actually speak together at these Asian conferences all throughout Asia. He would speak to the young people. I would speak to the adults. And one day we were just talking. I said, you know, um, I would love to hire you. But he lived in South Carolina at that time. I was in Los Angeles. And God uh, spoke to him. And he says, I'm coming. So as soon as he got married to Brittany, by faith he came. Uh, he didn't have a job, nothing. And just started to serve our church. He was living off his, his wedding gifts, you know live in Los Angeles. And so we hired him. So he's been on staff for like eight years now. I'm doing a great job. And then when he told me that Sean had invited him to run with him, I said, this is of the Lord. I've been involved in the Jesus People Movement. Now it's your turn to reach the lost. And God's using him so powerfully. He has led more people to Jesus Christ in the past year and a half than most people will in a lifetime. And so he's doing a phenomenal job. We're really proud of him. Well, he, he has a true, a spectacular talent and anointing. And I mean, it's it's obvious when you see it. Yeah. Otherwise, you wouldn't know. But it's just so it was so beautiful uh, to watch. And what did it mean to you to be in the nation's capital like that? Uh, it, it was it was a wonderful thing. People can see it online. I hope they'll they'll check it out. I've posted it. But it, it seemed very significant to me. Yeah, very significant, 9-11. And, of course, I, I grew up in Washington, D.C. My dad was the pastor at the uh, National Baptist Memorial Church right on 16th Street. We lived in Maryland, but his building was in Washington, D.C. Now, he didn't pastor the big church there. It was a small little uh, chapel with Korean students that the Korean government had sent to help rebuild Korea after the Korean War. And so they wanted a pastor. They, there was a Methodist church, a Presbyterian church in Washington, D.C., but there was no Baptist, and they wanted a Baptist. And Southern Baptist wrote to the board in Korea. My dad applied, and he got the job. Eric was like winning the lotto because there's no way you could immigrate to the United States in 1958. It was so hard. In fact, it wasn't until 67 under Johnson uh, that the immigration laws changed. But only special visas were given, and they were given to these students to help rebuild Korea after the Korean War. And uh, my dad was their pastor, but that opened the door for us to come. And what people don't realize is, is that this is, with all the problems in California and the progressive left movement, still the best nation in the world. Oh. You know, I love America. Now, listen, you are obviously from California. You had some horrible run-ins with Governor Newsom. T talk about that for a second. Well, what happened was is that when the lockdown happened in uh, March of 2020, I think all of us locked down. We didn't know what this pandemic was all about. And we President Trump's a 30-day lockdown, and so we wanted to comply. But then uh, my brother's a surgeon at Kaiser, and after the 30-day lockdown, uh, you know, they were saying that they just, we just got to flatten the curve, you know, and just, just hang in there. And uh, he was just saying, it's not what they're saying. Newsom was saying, now that this is how crazy the numbers were, and it was based on science and data out of 40 million in California, 22 million would get COVID and 2 million would die. Well, 2 million have died, but that's global numbers. Not in so this is, this he was, was saying really in California. to scare the heck out, out of, of people. Absolute. And there are many people today still scared to death oh, the spirit of, of something that, that they should California. not be scared of. 
and the spirit of fear. And, and so, but my brother being a doctor, a scientist, he just said, that's not what's happening. I'm, I'm here. We had to shut down everything so that we wouldn't overload the hospitals. And I, you know, I can't do my surgeries and people are dying of that. And yet there's not people dying of COVID at that time. And so I decided to open up on May 31st, 2020 on Pentecost Sunday. We already missed Easter, Palm Sunday. We missed our global conference, which people from all over the world will come to. And of course, of the global lockdown. And we decided to open. And um, and then he shut down the church again. He opened it up for 10% or 100 people, whatever is less, for like three-week period. And by the way, he said no singing when you're open. No singing or chanting, which is like, you're not supposed to interfere with a free exercise. What about enough. praying? <laughs> Folks, you will not believe how much you save at MyPillow.com when you use the code ERIC. Yay! Thanks. Folks, welcome back. I'm talking to my friend, Pastor Che Ahn of Harvest Rock Church in Pasadena, California. You were just talking about how uh, at the beginning of this COVID thing, it was pure madness and only a handful of pastors had the courage that you did. Uh, my friend, uh, our friend, Pastor Rob uh, McCoy, uh, Jack Hibbs, just a handful of, of yeah. pastors around John the country. MacArthur, you know. John MacArthur yeah. said, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna open up. We don't believe the church is uh, optional, and if you don't like it, come and get us." And so you got involved in lawsuits and all kinds of stuff, but you simply believed we're gonna follow God and not man. And it's very rare in America that we get to live out our faith this way. Well, what we saw was the double standard, the d discrimination, because right after uh, he locked down, of course, the George Floyd tragedy took place. And so 100,000 BLM and Tifa people were marching down, protesting and rioting, no social distancing, no mask. And you talk about racism, they targeted Fairfax, which is a Jewish community and destroyed their businesses. The next day, Newsom does a press conference and commends them. He says, your First Amendment rights must be protected. You will be protected. We will not arrest you. And, um, and your voices need to be heard. And then he closes with, God bless you. And I'm watching this, and something rose up within me. And I said, we're going to sue him. And so we end up suing Governor Newsom. The next month, I get a letter from our city prosecutor in Pasadena, the most egregious, dark letter. She said, we're going to arrest you. We just want to give you a heads up. We're coming to arrest you. It will be your term in jail. We're going to find your church members a thousand dollars per person since they've been meeting on uh, May thirty first, and then last paragraph we reserve the right to arrest your church members. That's what got me. I said this is crazy. This is madness because their Newsom was letting out prisoners during this time. A thousand. This of prisoners. is evil. This it is, is when evil. I mean, yeah. look. Let's let's be honest. We have been so blessed in America that it's very hard for us to imagine that our government could be this wicked. It's very hard for us to imagine. We've never seen anything like this. Well, it's Isaiah 520, that woe to those who call evil good, good, evil, darkness, light, light, darkness. And so that's what we're saying. So they're letting out prisoners, but they want to arrest law-abiding citizens who just want to worship Jesus. I mean, if that's not crazy madness, I don't know what it is. And so uh, we asked for an emergency injunction to protect me from being arrested. It was denied by an Obama federal judge. We went to the Ninth Circuit. It was denied there. And that's why elections do matter, because the federal judges there were all liberal. Ninth Circuit's the most liberal uh, appeals court. And then it went to the Supreme Court, and they didn't weigh on our constitutional right. They just weighed in on my uh, the, the, the arrest. And they said, that's totally unconstitutional. And that was December of 2020. And then was in February, they weighed in on the right to lock down. And then 6-3, which was a a surprise. John Roberts even sided with the others that it was totally unconstitutional to lock down the church. So we won. And this is something that will be a precedent for, for the future. In perpetuity, the governor can never lock down the church from now on. And this, this sets is a pre amazing. precedent for the rest of the states. So it was a huge victory for the church. Well, I think the for me, one of the takeaways is that when some of these government entities overreach, uh, the backlash, it's, I mean, it's by definition, they, they overreach and something happens which plays into God's hands because if they hadn't overreached, the church wouldn't rise up. If things hadn't gotten so bad, we wouldn't be fasting right. and praying. And as you know, with uh, Sean Foyt, we're, we're calling for 21 days 
of fasting and prayer, and people can get involved any way they want, but to pray for the nation. We are in a crucible right now. We're in the middle of something so important, but I do believe that the, but that the tremendous arrogance and foolishness of people like Governor Newsom forced people to wake up and to say, okay, now I better fight because this is, this is nuts. Well, I think the devil overplays his hand over and over again, even after the election loss, and my personal opinion was stolen, uh, a group of pastors— Wait, that the election was stolen? <laughs> That's crazy talk, man. We don't have that. This is mainstream radio. Alvin, we don't talk about crazy stuff. The election, <laughs> a U.S. election was stolen. Yeah. You know what? Now that you mention it, you're right. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Okay, yeah. so let's keep going. Yeah, so we were so discouraged in California, and I was personally discouraged because people don't know this, but I was campaigning for President Trump in 2020. September, October, I went to the battleground states with our churches there, meeting with pastors, encouraging them to register their people and vote biblically, to vote pro-life and vote for President Trump. And uh, and the tremendous turnout, I was so encouraged. There was so much momentum. I just said, you know, we're going to win this, hands down. And so when we had this election stolen, I was so discouraged. But it led to around 14 major leaders in California, and I would call them all apostles, not just in the church, but it's like uh, John Jackson, president of William Jessup University, um, uh, Shannon um, Grove, who's a state uh, senator, um, and other business people like Dave Diaz, we came together and we formed what's called Revive California. And what we're doing is, is that we're pulling our resources, this is a 501c4 organization, not a 501c3, and we're going to ask believers, conservative believers who are mature to run for office, and we're going to support them financially. And so right now for 2022, we have two pastors who are running for Congress, U.S. Congress in California. That's part of our network. And so we're seeing a surge of activism from pastors and believers, whereas before they were so apathetic and passive. And, um, you know, but there's a revival taking place. There's an awakening taking place. And so, again, I feel like the devil played his hand because if well, Trump had won, we would not have formed this but organization. But see, this is the point. This is the point. Uh, we're, you know, all things work together for good for those that love the Lord and call according to his purpose. That is the law of the word of God. And we need to understand that even when things horrible things happen, that if we give it to God, it works together for good. What we're seeing right now would not have happened if if the election hadn't been stolen. Exactly. So we had to see how bad it is. We'll be right back talking to Pastor Che on. He is with Harvest Rock Church in Pasadena. Don't go away. Folks, I want to remind you, uh, we're in the middle of 21 days of fasting and prayer. I don't know what that means to you, and it doesn't make any difference what it means to you, just as long as it means something. Do it. Uh, last night, uh, two nights ago, Suzanne and I fasted dinner uh, and we prayed. Whatever you want to do, however you want to do it, do it with friends. But our country is hanging in the balance. This is real. And if you don't believe in God, let me just tell you, stay tuned because I think that apart from God, we're dead. That's why many of us are praying. I'm sitting here with Pastor Che on. Um, Pastor Che, you know, we talk about how bad things have gotten in America, how it's woken up the church. But you and your father uh, particularly have experienced something way beyond this. We're talking about North Korea. Right. Like we think it's bad in this country. We don't – we're not even scratching the surface of the surface. Tell us about your father in North Korea. Well, the good news is that revival broke out in what is now North Korea in 1907 called the Pyongyang Revival. And it was really out of the trauma of the Japanese occupation in 1905 and then 1910, they became like a vassal state of, of Japan and they were colonized. But during that 45 years, tremendous revival broke out. And then, of course, 1945, the war ends. And Stalin wanted all of Korea to be communist, to be a buffer against Japan. And at that time was Truman because he was the unexpected president that just came in. Roosevelt had died. And he said no. And so they divided North and South Korea at the 38th parallel, North being communist, South being uh, democratic. But my dad was in North Korea. He was in Pyongyang. He was born in Pyongyang. He was trapped. And in 1948, Kim Il-sung became the dictator, the president. So this is the grandfather of the current Kim, head Kim of— Kim Jong-un, yeah. right, the grandfather, exactly. And he wanted to unify all of Korea under communism. 
And, and so in 1950, he arrested all the pastors because the pastors were the biggest threat. It's amazing because it's an atheistic government, right? Communism is atheist. And pastors are not going to bow their knees to BLM or Antifa or communism. Well, we, they were we going to, to only bow our knees to Jesus Christ. But we have to understand this always happens is that the biggest threat to any kind of dictator, any kind of government that is trying to crush people, the biggest threat is always those who believe in God, exactly. always. And exactly. it happens, it's happening in America. But of course, what you're talking about, in an atheist state right. like North Korea, suddenly the pastors are, they're the biggest threat. So your as father Dr. As Dr. Arrested. King said, we're to be the prophetic conscious, prophetic voice to the state. And so they arrested my father, 1950, then he, in June 1950, he invades with 75,000 soldiers, South Korea. It's like a blitzkrieg, it's like Hitler's uh, playbook and just overwhelms with Soviet tanks, Soviet behind them, overwhelms and pushes the Korean forces all the way to the city Pusan, which is the southern capital. Basically okay, the so second, this is obviously the beginning of the Korean War. Beginning of the Korean okay. War. And thank God for the U.S. soldiers. I could just cry even th you know, thinking about it because you know, we put down the U.S. armed forces so many times, but they have saved nations. And Truman said, Douglas MacArthur, uh, who was uh, in Japan at that time because he was the one who had won the World War II in the Asian Front and who was overseeing the the um, the uh, the nations after World War II and so he came in personally and had this brilliant strategy of going through the Yellow Sea and invading through Incheon, which is now a major city with the airport there, uh, to split North and South Korea army, I mean North Korea's army in half, and send a division down south and then descend the division up north, and was brilliant. The war could have been ended in six months. And so as they pushed the North Korean forces to the Chinese border, they released all the prisoners, and millions migrated down to South Korea, including my parents, my grandparents, um, and their family. Wow. And so a lot of people realized they hated communism. They couldn't wait to, they were able to, so there's this iconic picture of the North Koreans marching single file up north, and Korean women and children marching down because the men were conscripted. They were in the military. So it was women that really came down. But my dad came down because he was a pastor. He wasn't in the army. And uh, and thank God for the U.S. soldiers because I wouldn't be here, Eric. It wasn't in fact because he was a single pastor at that time. And he met my mom in Yongnok Presbyterian Church in Seoul, Korea, 1945. And I mean, the church started in 1945, but they met in that church, and uh, so here I am. But thank God for the U.S. forces. And, and, but unfortunately, the Chinese, North Chinese, uh, the Chinese government jumped in, and it ended up being a three-year war, and 50,000 American soldiers died in that war uh, for democracy. But now South Korea has boasted some of the world's largest churches, including Yonggi Cho. By the way, Yonggi Cho passed away today. I don't what? know if you heard that. 85, he passed oh away this morning. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And I knew him personally. I preached at his church. Did three nights of healing services in a wow. church. And well, so that church is such a phenomenon. It doesn't seem possible. When I started hearing about Paul Yonggi Cho's church and how many people are in this church, I said, how do you – I mean – how many people were eventually part of this church? Uh, 750,000 at the peak. When I preached, just in this building, there were 45,000 each night. It's like preaching at a stadium. 45,000. Yeah. yeah. And it, that's it just... before he got started. <laughs> I mean, no, it's crazy. It, no, it's it, it was uh, near his uh, retirement, but, but uh, he was just so full of the Holy Spirit. He brought revival to South Korea. And of course, you know, Korea boasts some of the world's Lord. My, my grandparents' church, Yongnok Presbyterian Church, uh, it's a small church of 80,000 members, so it's the largest what? church in the world, uh, Presbyterian church in the world. Yeah. And so so because of the democracy and the and the seed that was planted from the Pyongyang revival, yeah. so we, we see a tremendous uh, growth, economic growth. Korea is the 11th richest nation now in the world. And so we really need to pray for North Korea. We need to pray that we would redig the walls of the Pyongyang revival because now North Korea under communism is probably the worst communist nation as far as human rights go. No it's like living in a concentration camp. The whole country no is question. one big concentration no camp. No question. It is, it's beyond belief. That's why anybody that out of foolishness or ignorance 
uh, denounces America, denounces uh, uh, American uh, police, American military. We have done so much good, and so many have died right. for freedom. And, well, and people don't know what they're talking but about. But here's the thing that has been the wake-up call. So because of my dad, his background, the DNA that I received from him, all of a sudden I'm seeing socialism, Marxism, uh, creeping into California. Yeah. Uh, social, I mean, but, but that, and that's why you're so strong against it. We're going to go to a break, but, but we need to cover this. Folks, uh, we're talking to Pastor Che on Harvest Rock Church in Pasadena. You can go to hrockchurch.com, hrockchurch.com. Folks, you will not believe how much you save at mypillow.com when you use the code <laughs> Eric. Yay! Thanks. Hey, folks, a couple of minutes left with Pastor Che on. Okay. You were talking about how because you experienced communism, you have a fire for freedom in America. And because my parents experienced communism, I feel similarly right. that so many people don't have a clue what's going on. But we both know that the only answer is God. That's really not a cliche. Is. That yeah. is a fact. It is true. That's where we are. Absolutely. And I feel in the midst of the darkness that we're experiencing with COVID, with all the shaking economic meltdown and the division in our nation, I feel the light of revival is coming. Haggai 2.7 says, I'm going to shake all nations and I'll fill this house with glory. And then it goes on to say in verse 9, the glory of the latter house will be greater than the glory of the former. Now, Haggai was prophesying and he was interpreting it's going to be the temple that they would build under Zerubbabel in this post-exilic period because the first temple got destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. And so he was saying this glory is going to be greater than the glory that Solomon experienced when he dedicated the temple in Second Chronicles 5. But it didn't happen. We read Ezra 6 at the de dedication, no glory came. He was prophesying of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. And now we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. First Corinthians 3.16 and the Holy Spirit dwells within us. And so God's been moving Throughout the 2,000 years of history, and by the way, we've been in the last days for the last 2,000 years, because one day is like 1,000 years to the Lord, 1,000 years is one day. And so in these last days, he promises glory of the latter house will be greater than the glory of the former. So even though Acts 2 was tremendous and the Great Awakening was tremendous and the Reformation was wonderful, Second Great Awakening, all the revivals of Zusa Street, we're going to experience the greatest revival in the history of the church. And it's not hyperbole. It's not exaggeration. It is scripture because the Bible says that the glory of the latter house will be greater than the glory of the former. And of course, Habakkuk 2.14 says that the knowledge of glory of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea, which uh, sounds redundant, water over the sea. But what he's talking about, just like the last time the waters covered the sea was Noah's flood. And uh, we were going to see such a tsunami flooding of God's presence and glory. And people are going to know this glory. They're going to know Christ in us, the hope of glory. And so we're going to see the greatest revival. And of course, Jesus said in Matthew 13, the harvest is at the end of the age. Right now, Eric, uh, according to Dave Barrett's encyclopedia, 200,000 people are getting saved every day globally. 35,000 in China every day, 35,000 in India. We see Indonesia, the largest Muslim nation, is now 40% born again. Wow. And so we're seeing a global harvest in Brazil, and it's just the beginning. You know, I had a friend of mine who prophesied a billion soul harvest that he said it's going to happen after he died, and he died in 2014, Bob Jones. And we're seeing it, and people are so ripe because right now with the pandemic, people are turning to God left and right. You know, as um, C.S. Lewis said in The Problem of Pain, he said, God shouts to us when we're suffering pain. And so people are suffering right now because who needs God if everything's great? You know, everything's going well. That's but the, the moment we are in suffering, we start turning to God. And so I feel the harvest is right. But we need to activate the church to share good yeah. news, to be good news, to proclaim that Jesus died for our sins and rose again. I see it happening in, in, uh, in my own life. I see it more and more wherever I go that this is true. This is happening. There's a desperation where people are finally getting to the point where they say, you know what? Okay, I get it. God is the only answer. Yeah. And that's a good place to be, folks. Even if you have to suffer to get there, that's, even that's God's mercy. Pastor Che, uh, it's just wonderful to see you, uh, to be with you in the same room. I want to encourage people to visit your church in Pasadena, hrockchurch.com, Harvest Rock 
Church.com. Uh, I hope to see you in person out there where it's sunnier than it is here. Uh, but well, you preached at our joy. church. You did such a tremendous job, and we need to have you come back. I would love to come back. We'll talk about that offline. But my joy to have you on this program. Thank you. Well, thank you.